Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the church being the church. Uh, serving one another, serving you. Loving on one another, loving you. Lord, uh, we've been called to, to love God, uh, to love others, and to make an impact. We make an impact in different ways. And we're thankful, Lord, that you give us talents and gifts that we can serve you with and we can bless you with. And we can make an impact uh, on this community and we can make an impact on the world around us. And so we pray, Lord, that you'd continue to bring the, the Christmas message home to our heart and let it not stop here in our hearts. Let it flow through us to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are talking through our Christmas series, and it's about the greatest story ever told. We've already talked about a confident hope. We've already talked about continuous joy today, about concrete peace, peace that just you can stand on, you can live. Last week, the assignment uh, was to share joy with someone, uh, with three people, look for an opportunity. If you haven't done that, I'll give you an extra week to work on, you know, sharing some joy with someone. <clears throat> it was also, you know, one of the challenges was uh, give somebody the opportunity to do a joy check in your life. Um, so if you have a bad attitude, you know, they can say to you, you know, hey, joy check. Yeah, uh, I didn't even give my daughter the uh, right to do it, but she did it anyways on me. And so that's just the way it goes in our house. You know, I was like, you know, I was grumpy about something. And she's like, joy check, dad. I'm like, oh, man. I'm not supposed to. But I, like, I preached it, so I got to live it. And so that's how it is right there. And so that's kind of one of those good challenges that, that, you know, we need that sometimes. We need someone to just say, hey, joy check. And then it was cool because our, our, our youth pastor says to me, he goes, you know, there's a thing called vibe check with teens today. I'm like, no. I randomly stumble into these things. And so he goes, yeah, that's the way they say to each other, vibe check, like if you're not having good vibes or something coming out of you or something like that. And so, yeah, that's good. So I want you to keep practicing that joy check. And if you haven't done it to your spouse yet, um, just be ready to run, okay? That's it, all right? Be near the door. Okay, just kidding. So that's good stuff, all right? Today, we're talking about peace. 2,000 years ago, a, 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 a myriad, a, a large group of angels show up and they proclaim the greatest most amazing announcement ever glory to god in the highest and on earth peace and on earth peace we'll put the verses up there so you can watch four different ways i put it up there on earth peace among those whom he is pleased on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. Now, they're all trying to capture something that came from some angels. It's a very powerful message. What an announcement. What a powerful announcement when you think, when you realize this comes from the throne of God. These are his words. Go announce. Go announce on earth peace. Peace has landed. Peace has landed. Right? Here's the predicament. It's been 2,000 years. Where's the peace? Just in the last 100 years, we can name war after war after war, from World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, I'm skipping some here and there, the Gulf War, the War on Terror, just even in our own lifetime, war after war after war. What if, what if the peace he came to announce wasn't political. It's obviously it wasn't political, right? What if there was a greater, deeper, bigger peace that he has for us? What is it, right? What if he has something different? This morning, I want to talk about three kinds of peace. And in our world, we have people talk about peace all the time. They talk about peace and about how do you got, get your inner peace and how do you come to peace with yourself? How do you find peace the peace symbol was a big thing of, of, of the 60s. Let's all have peace, love, hugs, things like that, you know. And, and now, where is peace? I'll tell you a little bit about the words before I get into our points, okay? The Hebrew word for peace found in the Old Testament is shalom. 
Okay? The, the Greek word found in the New Testament is hareni. Okay? They're both words used for peace. Okay? In the Bible, there are about 790 verses on peace. So it's going to be a long sermon. Okay? <laughs> I've got some verses to cover. All right? There's quite a few. 790 verses dealing with this. The deeper peace that Jesus gives us is a threefold peace. It's going to be an upward peace, it's going to be an inward peace, and it's going to be an outward peace. And it goes in that order for it to work correctly. It goes upward, it comes inward, and then it goes outward. And that's the order it needs to go in first. So let's begin with point number one, the peace of God, which is an upward peace. This is an eternal peace. This is a peace that comes from God. This is a peace that the Bible says, uh, we'll go to the word shalom, has the idea of completeness. Uh, of a wholeness, of, of your being complete, right? Uh, I just put a few of the words uh, directly out of my Hebrew dictionaries, out of my lexicons that, 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 that they use to translate this. And then safeness, satisfaction, blessing, prosperity, friend, tranquil, content, salvation, deliverance. There are more, but I was running out of room, okay? And so there's so many words that they use to translate this simple word, shalom, that we turn into peace. It means so much more than the simple words that we look for. Uh, there's a story of a guy named Gideon in the book of Judges. Uh, he is one of the judges, one of the leaders. He is what I call the insecure leader, uh, because every time he gets a word from the Lord, he goes, well, are you sure it's this way? Let's put out a fleece this way. No, no, let's check and do it. Let's do another fleece, okay? And, well, I'm not really sure if I want to do this. So the Lord has to send him an angel over and over, and he's afraid he's going to die. He's not sure. And so finally, you know, the angel has to say to him, hey, peace, you're not going to die. Literally, the angel has to speak to him. And so it says in, in Judges chapter 6 that he builds an altar to the Lord. God's shown up. I'm going to make a sacrifice. God has spoken in my life. He has done something. And when God does something in me, I respond. That's the call. When God works in your life, you don't just sit there and go, okay. What do I do? You respond. If God is a giving God and he does something and you give too. If God works in your life and forgives you, then you forgive too. And if God loves on you, you love too. And if you haven't loved, if you haven't given, if you haven't, it just means nothing's happened in you. Because if God works in you, he's going to work through you. And so when God works in him, he says, oh, I'm going to make an altar to you. And he makes an altar, and it's called Yahweh Shalom. God of peace. And this is what he is acknowledging on this altar when he names it. He is saying that God is the source of all peace. That's what he's trying to make the sense. And as I've looked at this and I've studied about this, and I've thought to myself, does that make peace an attribute of God? Or it's the all-encompassing who God is. He is the God of peace. You see, when he puts that name on there, he is declaring that he is the God of peace. Peace, the only source of real peace. He is the full sense of where I get my completeness. He is the full sense of when I find out who he is, who I am. I cannot know who I am until I discover who he is and who I am in his image. It's ugly sweater Sunday, obviously. Some of you don't understand that this comes from Jesus. He wore the first ugly sweater. How do I know that? Because he put on human flesh. And that's ugly. And your babies are so cute. Because you're a human looking at how cute a baby is. You're not a God looking at how ugly flesh is. His glory was so amazing that when he put on flesh, it was disgusting. His glory is so high and exalted that when he took on flesh, that was a downgrade. That's an ugly sweater. We don't get the fact that his glory is amazing, that he's so high and exalted beyond what a simple baby is. We look up to babies. We think they're beautiful. And yes, they are, but they're still a downgrade to the amazing glory of God. That's how far we fall short of understanding his great character and his great glory. That we don't think it's that big of a step for him to turn into a baby. We miss the point. He was God. And he put on an ugly sweater to connect to us. That's a good thing to realize. And yet we, we well, that's a, just kind of an insult to a baby. Right! 
That's the point. We look too highly to babies and we look too lowly to the glory of God. Do you get it? That's where we miss it. That's where we miss it. He is the son. And so here's the connect that we have to have that we miss when it says in Isaiah 9 verse 6. When I wrote that down, that was dyslexia, by the way, on your outline. I mix things up sometimes, sorry. But verse 9, uh, chapter 9 verse 6, it says, and a son, it says, it, says, it says, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting, Father, Prince of Peace. Why is he the Prince of Peace? Because Yahweh Shalom is the King of Peace. Do you get that? Yahweh Shalom is the King of Peace. His Son is the Prince of Peace. That's the connect. That's the part we miss. We don't want to miss the fact that He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. Right? But the problem we have is we don't understand that when God brings peace, it comes with violence. It comes with battle. It comes with war. Peace costs. When Jesus comes, he comes to fight a battle, and that battle is won in violence. Only the violence is perpetrated on him on the cross. And at that point, to bring peace, he had to fight a war, and the war was against the devil, and the devil was his opponent. And he's not done yet. You see, we read in Romans 1, verse 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, peace with God comes from what Jesus has done and will do for us. It's what he's done on the cross for us, but he's not done yet. In order for peace to be accomplished, war will happen again. There is one greater, greater bigger battle coming, and it's tells, we're told in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, the God of peace. The one who's just tranquil and painful or painless and, and kind and calm. No, this is the God of peace. We'll soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. <laughs> That's how he ends Romans. If you've never read the fact that he says, our God is a God of peace, but it takes war sometimes to establish peace because we're in a battle. And the battle isn't with each other, and it isn't with humans. It is a spiritual battle that Jesus is the only one that can win. And if you're not on his team, you will lose. And so when Jesus comes to fight the battle for us as the Prince of Peace, he will establish peace. But war only points to the fact that we need the living God. We need the living God. And so here's your application. I'm doing it a little different these this week. I'm putting the application right with you. I encourage you this week to seek shalom. Real completeness in Christ this week. As you're stressing about things, as you're worrying about things, as you're stressing about, well, you didn't buy enough of this or you missed the present here or this, don't just sit back and look to Jesus for your peace. Drink him in. Experience him in your life. Uh, you're, you see, it's easy to lose your peace. Like this Minnesota, a Minnesota couple. Um, they're from Minneapolis. They decided to go to Florida to thaw out during the icy winter. Okay? They planned to, to, to stay in the hotel where they had spent their honeymoon 20 years ago. Because of their hectic schedules, it was difficult, and, and the couple had to coordinate their plans. So, so he went down early, a day ahead of time, and she was coming down on Friday. And so he got there on Thursday, and, and the husband checked into the hotel, and there was a computer. And so he decided he would send his wife an email. And, and as he went to send her an email, he accidentally let, left one little letter out of her address. And so he, uh, he accidentally sent the email to the wrong person without even realizing it. Meanwhile, there was in Houston a widow who had just returned from her husband's funeral. He was a Baptist minister who had been called home to glory following a heart attack. And the widow decided to check her email after, after the services and, and reading the, you know, looking for condolence messages, right, from friends and family, she thought she might read her emails. The first one, she read, she screamed, she fainted. So her son comes running into the room to find his mother on the floor, and he saw the screen, computer screen open, to which the email said this, to my loving wife, subject, I just arrived today. I know you're surprised to hear from me. 
They have computers here now. You're allowed to send emails to your loved ones. Since I've just arrived, I thought I would send you an email. Everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey as, is uneventful as mine was. It sure is freaking hot down here. <laughs> oh, she thought they came from her back. See, we have one little thing comes into our life and it can rock our world. It's a terrible little email, sorry, okay? Inward peace, number two, inward peace. What we really need when we've experienced peace with God is an inward peace. It's a self-peace. It's peace with self. It's the, the, the inward peace, internal peace. The National Center for PTSD reports that approximately six out of 10 men and five out of 10 women suffer from anxiety of some sort. And yet Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit, having a relationship with the living God, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Peace, peace. Peace is a fruit of a constant focus on God and not our problems. We, we read in Philippians that, we, that, that when we have times of anxiety, Paul writes in Philippians 4, chapter 6, he says, do not be anxious about anything. Oh, that's too hard. I get anxious about lots of things. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. The peace that we just talked about with God, we talk about having peace with God. When I have that peace of God, it will impact me, which, which surpasses all of my thinking, all of my understanding. It's going to guard my heart. It's going to guard my mind, right? It's going to protect my thinking. It's going to protect me. When I have peace with God, it's going to impact my heart. It's going to impact my thinking. The problem we have in life is that we want to create our own peace. We want to fix the world around us, get all of our ducks in a row, then I'll have peace. Clean the house, then I'll have peace. Get all the presents, check all the things on my list, then I'll have peace. And God says, that peace doesn't last. It's not going to last. The peace that you need is the peace from me. You need peace from God for it to transform your life first. When that happens in me, and I say, God, I need you to transform me, then I feel his peace. And the peace he gives, if you've not experienced it, is different than the world's. This is why Jesus says, he says, the peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give you the peace as the world gives you, so don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. See, the problem we have is we think that the peace that God gives and the peace of the world are the same thing, but they're two different things. And Jesus says, no, they're completely different. Do you know how you know you don't have peace? I bet I can help you figure out where you lose your peace. You lose your peace when you listen to yourself. Listen for just a little bit, once in a while, to how you talk to yourself. Your self-talk. That inner voice inside of you is not often your friend. You forget something, and then, oh, there you are. Oh, how stupid did I, oh, I, I gotta go back and get it. No? Or, or, or your, your boss calls you and says, hey, hey, I need you to stop by. I need to talk to you for a minute. Oh, no, this is gonna be bad. Where does that inner voice in you go? Where does that thought go? Are you critical of yourself? Are you negative of yourself? Or is it the voice of the Lord that's peaceful, loving, kind? Or where is your inner voice? Who are you listening to? We often have a negative voice inside of us. And, 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 and so if you're listening to your self-talk, if you're realizing sometimes you're your own worst enemy. And that's not a God. Not a God. Because his word is kind. His word is loving. I read his word and it's encouraging. Now, if his word is convicting and it's not shameful, it leads me to repentance. And then that's good. But if his word, if, if something is coming to me and it's shameful, it's not of God. Right? How do you listen to yourself? What do you hear? So I want you to think, I, I want you to hear this really clearly, okay? You will never feel your way into a deeper relationship with God. If you're living your life based on your feelings, you are never gonna get closer to God. Never. But you can think your way into new habits. 
that will respond, result in a deeper relationship with God. The Bible doesn't say, and transform your feelings. No, it says, and transform your mind or your thinking. And then start thinking about the good things, and then the good things will come. See, see, when what you think determines how you act, and how you act determines how you feel. You are never going to feel your way into a godly marriage. You have to act your way into a godly marriage. You have to base your life on your truth, on the truth of God, and say, Lord, I will live this way and honor you, and God will allow the feelings to come. But if you are going to sit back and wait for the feelings to come, they don't come. Because Satan toys with your feelings. But when you live your life based on the truth of God, on peace, he will transform your feelings. And you begin to obey, and you begin to believe, and you begin to honor God, and you begin to live the way that you're supposed to, and before you know it, the feelings will come. When Jesus was at the Garden of Gethsemane, he was not feeling his way to the cross. He was surrendering in his mind, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. I don't feel good about doing this, Lord. It's pretty hard. But he said, Lord, I will surrender. I make the choice in my mind to obey you. I make the choice in my mind to do what you want me to do. I make the choice in my mind, and the feelings come. Did it feel good to go to the cross? No, not on the way. But now it does. We are his victory. He won us. We are the spoils, and that's what brings us peace, right? And so stop trying to just think your, feel your way, feel your way into faith, think your way, follow your actions, and allow the feelings to come, right? So here's the, the, here's the application for this this week. Simply, I want you to stop and speak peace to your inner voice. When that inner voice is critical, when that inner voice is being critical, and you are being critical of yourself, I want you to speak peace. I want you to talk about the grace of God. You need to preach to yourself. You need to remember some scriptures. You need to voice those scriptures to yourself. I've been forgiven. There's therefore not no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Just read Romans chapter 8 four or five times. You'll be feeling great at the end. Right? Because you'll realize he's done everything for you. Right? And that'll help your feelings. Nothing can separate you. Oh, I've messed up. Yeah, you have. But nothing can separate you from the love of God. Right? Let me talk a little bit about our anxieties. I've been giving you some lists of tens. Here are ten of what are the most common anxieties. Most common anxieties start from work and school. Stress. Just the stress of those things build up in people, right? The stress, and this is a key one, unrealistic expectations. We worry about things that never happen, right? We worry about things, uh, and Andrew, is a, some, I think he's got a saying, like, don't worry about something that in five years it doesn't matter. It's a great saying, right? We worry about things that don't matter. Stress in personal relationships. We have a lot of stress that comes from our personal relationships, these just really, really kind of overwhelm us. Sometimes. Financial stresses. Financial stresses can cause anxiety. But God speaks peace into all these areas of our life. All these stress, stress from emotional trauma, such as the loss of a loved one. Uh, today is the one-year anniversary of me becoming an orphan. My dad died last year, this day. So a year ago... I had no more parents. I realize that. And it hits you at a point where something hits you hard when you have loss and you have no connection now to your past generations. It's different how we experience our traumas and we can't resolve things. Uh, go back another one. I, emotional trauma in the sense of, of I never got to fix that relationship completely. It'll always be undone in my life. We have traumas and anxiety. And yet, at the point, I have to choose peace. And I have to choose God. I can't look to a person to accomplish in my life only what you did for me. What he's done. So you too, as we look to the Lord for our healing and our stresses, unrealistic expectations I have sometimes of myself, Number six, stress from a serious medical illness. 
We got different people I talk with who have different stresses from different medical illnesses when they are dealing and processing. Side effects of medicine can cause your stress. You start taking this. If you're using drugs, illegal use, uh, or use of illicit drugs, you know, cocaine, some of these things have really negative things. And I recommend, don't do that. Just saying. Right? Don't do that. I would suggest don't go that way. Number nine, symptoms of medical illnesses such as heart attack, stroke, uh, hypoglycemia. A number of these things can impact, can bring stressors in your body as you're leading up to those things in that process, can lead you to stress. They are like God's sign that you have something wrong that you need to see your doctor. Don't wait too long, okay? Your diet, too much caffeine, too much pop, too much coffee, too much energy drinks, right? Maybe you got to look at that. That's adding anxiety to your life. Interesting, I read that doctors um, often have the difficult task of determining which symptoms come from which causes. For example, in a study on chest pain uh, as, as a sign of heart disease, 43% of, of those are, who they've looked at, they thought were chest pains, 43% were people who had panic disorders, not heart-related conditions. Wow, wow, 43%, almost half. And, and just dealing with the anxiety that we deal in the world. I've been reading this week, I love to read uh, World War II books and reading uh, a book called The Dead Drink First. And um, this is really interesting because some of the side effects they were talking about from, from World War II and the trauma. And I've talked to a few people in our church a little bit about this and they said, yeah, this happened in my family. When the World War II vets came back, and if your parent, anybody's parent, you was a World War II vet, then you might remember. A lot of them came back having what they called shell shock. Ever heard the term shell shock? Okay. They come back having gone through some kind of that. A lot of the guys coming back from World War II were so shook from this that they turned to a drinking, or some of them would turn to alcoholism. Some of them got so into from their war experiences that they couldn't emotionally experience connection with other people. And so they withdrew and they, wouldn't, they couldn't connect to other people because of the problems they've been through. And, and, and if you grew up with a dad like that, that he drank or he was always going off, going, his temper would just fly off the handle because you never knew what was going to go off because of what he had experienced, that trauma. It's like that. they're saying now, they're understanding that trauma was passed to the next generation. You have a trauma because you're afraid that dad's going to freak out again. He's going to go off because you just don't know what might set him off. And then sometimes, as I've talked to some people, that they have experienced the sense that they fear God that way. That God will just get them. when they're. In. And we start to translate these issues in our life, these problems, anxieties in our life from, from situations we've had on earth to our Father, our Heavenly Father. And we walk with these pains that He wants to heal us from. And heal us inner so that we can have a better peace with people around us. Third, third thing is uh, peace with others. This is outward peace, outward peace. How do we have peace with others? We have so much conflict around us. I, I deal with many things of conflict that come with me. I, I got a phone call this week. Hey, we got a problem with the carpet. I, we need you to come in and meet with us. Okay, okay. We got a problem. We got a leak in the church. I got another thing. Okay, we got, an, we got another, I've got different problems. I got someone with a marriage problem or someone with this problem. So many different problems. There's so much conflict in our world. And how do we bring peace and help people with the peace of God in the midst of conflicts? Peace with others. How do you have peace? A business owner uh, wanted to send flowers to his friends because he was opening a new office. And he, so when he got there, he saw the flowers on the desk and, and the desk said, uh, the flowers said, rest in peace. It's like, oh man, outrage. He stopped by the florist office to complain. Say, hey, hey I ordered uh, 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 the flowers to be sent to my friend. It looks like they got mixed up. He said, yeah, it could be worse, the florist said. Just think today, somewhere, someone was buried with the flowers that, with an arrangement that said, congratulations on your new location. <laughs> These people get things mixed up, right? People make mistakes, sometimes on purpose and sometimes just by accident, right? But Romans tells us this in Romans 12, 18, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. If you're seeking revenge, you're doing God's job. Forgive. Live at peace. 
Live in harmony. Harmony means let the conflict go. Let it go. This Christmas, some of you need to let some crap go. Someone in your family hurt you years ago. Stop being so petty and let it go. That's what I want to say to you today. If you're a Christian, you're called to forgive and let things go. Live at peace. I was searching for understanding more and more what this happened. So I opened the Bible knowledge commentary in my computer program, and I read where it says this. Harmony with others may not always be achievable, but believers should not be responsible for the lack of peace. It's like, I like that quote. Then I realized, my goodness, my, my, my wife's grandfather wrote that, Dr. Dr. Whitmer. It's a great quote. And then I read... William Barclay, he said this about churches. When strife enters into any Christian church, the hope of doing good work is gone. Realize that? When strife comes into us as Christians, we lose the opportunity to do the good work he's called us to do. Don't miss what God has for you because you're hanging on to something petty. Don't miss it. If you're a new person and you're a new Christian, then, when, then you, when are you going to act like it? We need to act like it because the peace of Christ will take precedent. It comes first in your life. In, in Colossians 3, verse 5 through 15, I'm not going to read them all because it says this is put to death the old nature. In verse 5, it says, as God's chosen people, put on the holy, like clothe yourself with all these good things, right? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and bear with one another. Forgive each other, whatever grievances you are. And notice it doesn't say whenever they ask for forgiveness. And it doesn't say if they deserve forgiveness. When they live up to your expectations. He says, bear with each other, forgive each other, whatever grievances you have, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Right? And then it says, verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Oh, when I choose my petty, petty, unforgiveness things, I am choosing to have that have preference over the rule of Christ in my life. Oh, I don't want to be that way. I don't want to live that way. I want to walk in the peace of Christ. So application is this. When you're in conflict, I want you to say to yourself this week, I am going to choose peace and I'm going to let this go. I'm going to choose peace. I'm going to let this go. You cannot do this in your own strength. The gospel message is this. God so loved us that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And that life comes now. That life comes now. Choose peace. Walk away from conflict. Let's pray. Lord, we want the peace of Christ to rule in us. And so we choose peace today. We want to choose the peace of Christ when we recognize the glory of God came in the form of a child. You came and put yourself in the human flesh for us. You stoop to our level. We can bear to understand the great step that you took coming down to us. And we receive you. And we desire your peace. Who are we, Lord, to stay on our high horse and hold a grudge when you got off your high horse and you came to earth to love us? We want to choose peace today. To be like you and to offer forgiveness even to those who don't deserve it. Soldiers never ask for forgiveness, yet you said forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord, let us become Christ-like today in choosing peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.